Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome along to DBA Fundamentals Down Under for the month of October. In this month's session, we've got Erin uh, Stellato from SQL Skills talking to us about statistics and query plans. Before I hand over to Erin, just got a couple of uh, housekeeping to run through. First thing is for those of you who may be aware, Past Summit is coming up in a couple of weeks' time. There's still time to buy some uh, tickets to this wonderful summit. If you use the discount code uh, there, you'll see that you'll get $150 off your uh, week-long session ticket. So if you haven't bought already, I do suggest that you look at uh, buying that. There's some fantastic speakers and sessions available for that, uh, session, uh, for that summit. Now at uh, summit, there is the Birds of Feather luncheon. So if you want to uh, spend time with uh, MVPs, speakers, etc., make sure that you put that in your calendar and uh, come along to that luncheon. There are some uh, paraphernalia and, that you can purchase from uh, Summit this year, so make sure that you stop by the, uh, the store and pick up your Summit gear. Now, I know you're all here for this session, but there are other um, virtual chapter sessions that uh, are happening. So we've got a list of what is coming up over uh, the next couple of days uh, to take advantage of. So if you're into some of those sessions, feel free to register and turn up and go along and listen and learn. So we've got some more from cloud, uh, different uh, languages. This is a list of all of the virtual chapters that you can sign up and uh, be advised of. Stay tuned and stay in touch with the, uh, with the community. We've got some upcoming SQL Saturday events worldwide. We can see the dates here. So if you haven't registered already, make sure that you go to each one of those uh, in your area. Uh, if you want to be a, a presenter and the submission for sessions is still open, make sure you submit. It's a great way to meet other presenters, meet other people in your community, and uh, grow as a community member. There's also volunteering opportunities for you to uh, go through with PASS, so feel free to log in and uh, uh, make yourself available to do some PASS volunteering. So with that, I'll now hand over to Erin uh, to get this month's session started. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate the opportunity to present. And let me just make sure that I can view questions. Oh, which I don't remember how to view, how to do, and so I'm not going to stress about that. And if there are any, you will let me know. I will. All right. <laughs> okay, and if there's any issues, um, hopefully you'll be able to interrupt me, but knock on wood, we've done pretty well the last few times I have done remote sessions. So today we are going to talk about statistics and query plans and just some basic information as we get started here. Most important information on this screen, this About Me slide, is my email address, erin at sqlskills.com. If you've got questions about this session, please, and you don't get them answered during the session, please feel free to email me. If you're on Twitter, you can reach out to me at Erin Stellato, and there's my blog. I have a new post that I need to get up. That just reminds me about that. Okay. If you're not familiar with SQL Skills, that's the company uh, for which I work, and the owners are Paul Randall and Kimberly Tripp, and then Glenn Berry, Jonathan Cahayas, Tim Redney, and myself are the team members. We provide training mostly in the U.S. We were in Australia last year. I hope we come back to Australia very soon because we had a fantastic time. Um, and we were in London this summer. So we've got a little bit more training coming up this year, but we also have training online through Pluralsight. And we also do consulting, and if you want to hear from us on a regular basis, you can go to sqlskills.com slash insider, and you'll get an email from Paul every other week with some good info in it. So here's information about our immersion events if you want to learn more about those. We've got a site for that as well. It's just our training page. And this is one of my favorite slides because I get to give out Paul's email address. It's paul at 
practicalskills.com. Some of you may have already emailed him about this offer, but if you haven't, you can email him directly and you can mention this session and he will um, provide to you, if you ask, right, user group, Pluralsight code, provide to you a code to give you 30 free days of access to Pluralsight so that you can see what it has to offer. Uh, we've got lots of training on there, um, over 120 hours at this point, and we're all working on additional courses right now. Actually, I have one that I'm working on for Query Store. But tonight, we are going to talk about statistics. So this is the abstract. I'm not going to read it to you. I'm assuming that everyone's read it already, but being as this is the DBA Fundamentals, uh, VC, this is going to be a fundamental session. So we are going to talk about statistics really from the ground up and you'll understand what people mean when they talk about cardinality estimates and the CE and, and what that means. So here's our plan. We're going to talk about how the optimizer uses statistics and as we're doing that you should hopefully start to understand really what stats are. And we'll talk about how we find stats in a plan. And then we will talk, in, uh, talk about what happens to our plans when statistics update. And I'll go through, as I go through, I'll stop, I'll see if there's any questions, um, type away. Uh, I'll say this now and I'll try to say it again later. I will make sure that the slides and the scripts are available for you guys to download from the site. So you will be able to get those and take a look at things later on. All right. So we're going to start by talking about how the optimizer uses stats. And we'll do a few slides first and then we'll hop into a demo because I think that demos are a great way to understand really what's going on. So if you think about what statistics are when we talk about SQL Server specifically, I like to say that they are information about how data looks in a column or in a set of columns in a table or an index view. And the best way, I think, to actually understand this is to get a visual. And so you can see this information in SQL Server inside something called the histogram. And what I like to do is take that histogram and make it visual with a graph. So this is another way to think of statistics, to think of that histogram, right? It's the distribution of data for a column. And along the bottom, as you can see, those are last names. And the blue lines are indicating how many values are equal to each of those last names. So this tells us that um, for the last name of Alexander, which is all, all the way over there on the left, we have a pretty high number. But if we come across to the right and we look at something like, oh, let's see, TN, we have a very small number. Right? So this tells us how that data is distributed throughout the column. And this is just last names, but anywhere you have a statistic on a column, you have this type of information within SQL Server, and the optimizer uses that information. So it's important to understand, though, how these statistics get created so that you know when to expect them. And that's going to help you understand how the optimizer is going to use them. So they get created for you automatically every time you create an index, a filtered index, or an index view. SQL Server manages the statistic for those objects and it happens for you in the background. They also get created for individual columns either automatically or manually. Manually meaning you go in there and you do a create statistic command to create the statistic for a column. It happens automatically when you query a column or when you join on a column that is not a leading column in an index. So if we go back to the histogram that I had for last name, let's say that in an index I had last name and then I had first name. So when, I, when, when that index gets created, the index um, statistic exists for last name. But if I ever write a query that queries for where first name equals Aaron, then it will create the statistic on that first name column. And it does that for me in the background automatically. Now, you can have a statistic on multiple columns, but those are created manually. So you have to issue the create statistics uh, command for that to occur. And then you also get them for filtered values created manually. So different than a filtered index, you can have just a filtered statistic that you create, again, with the create statistics command. And a great example of where this is used is in tables that are very, very large, like think millions or hundreds of millions of rows, where the histogram that gets created by default doesn't do a great job of representing the distribution of data. So I can create additional statistics on a column multiple sets of statistics, really, 
to give the optimizer better information. So this is how they get created, right? Lots of ways that we can get statistics in the system. So if I want to view them, I'm going to use sys.stats to do so. Now, I can also use sys.indexes, I can use stats date, or I can use DMDB stats properties, right? I've got some, some variations for how I can look at this. I tend to, to start with sys.stats and, and go out from there. The DMDB stats properties, depending on what version you're running, it's in 2008 R2 ST2 and higher, in 2012 ST1 and higher, and then in 2014 and 2016. All right, now, how does the optimizer use these statistics, right? Why does the optimizer care about the distribution of data? Well, when you write a query, right, let's say that, I say, let's say that I'm going to query the person's table and I want to um, select everybody who has a last name of Smith. So I submit that query to SQL Server, and that gets passed over to the query optimizer. And the optimizer looks at that query and it says, okay, what kind of join do I need to do here? Maybe I'm pulling information from multiple tables. Um, what, am I going to use indexes? Am I going to pull the data directly from the table? Am I going to do a seek? Am I do a scan? There's all kinds of things that it decides beyond just these three things that I have listed here. But it, it looks at all of, it, it makes this decision and then it comes up with a query plan, right? Because every query that you submit has to have a plan. But in terms of the optimizer, when it's trying to decide what kind of join, what's it going to access, how is it going to access that, it's using the statistics that you have for the last name column in our example to estimate how many rows it's going to get back, to estimate the cardinality. So when I say where last name equals Smith, it can look at the histogram for last name and say, oh, according to this histogram, I'm going to get back 1,000 rows for Smith. That's how it uses, one way that it uses statistics, right? So it uses those to figure out what is the best way for me to go and, and get this data, or in the case where I'm modifying data, to go, to go and modify that. And most of the time, there's always exceptions, but most of the time that plan goes into cache and it gets reused every time that exact same query is run. So we're going to hop into a demo here so that we can take a look at the statistics, how to find them, and then how the optimizer uses them. But before I flip over, I want to see if there's any questions, because I still haven't figured out how to view it myself. Not at this stage, Erin. All right, everyone's fascinated and right with me. I love it. OK, so let's flip over to my demo. And of course, i got to find it in my multitude of screens that none of you are seeing, which is a really good thing. Okay, and we're going to start out with, here we go. So we're going to use 2014. I haven't upgraded this VM to 2016 yet, but we'd have the same behavior in 2016. And if any of you are in 2016, I'm so impressed. That, that's fantastic. Same behavior there. But we're working in 2014 against an AdventureWorks copy of the database. So the easiest way to look at that for a table. And if some of you would be like, oh, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to expand the table and I'm going to go and I'm going to look at the statistics here. That was a lot of clicks that I just went through. I don't want to spend that much time. I've got two SQL. So I can use SP help stats and you enter the name of the table and then you can enter all to see all of them. And I include that here because if I don't, you'll notice that I get one row back. And there is no way that this object only has one statistic. So when I include all, you'll see I get four rows back. And the difference here is these statistics are my index statistics. And this one here with the underscore WA underscore sys is a column level statistic that was created for me automatically by SQL Server. So SP help stats is, is nice, but it's deprecated. Right, so the better way is to use this dot stats and combine it with some of the other catalog views. So this is kind of a fun query that I have. It's got this dot stats and objects and schemas and indexes. And we're just looking for the sales order detail table as we were before. So let's go ahead and run that query. And I get the same information. I get four rows, but I get a lot more, more detail. So I've got the table. I've got the index ID if it's an index statistic. So again, these first three are, 
and this tells me the index that they're associated with it in terms of the index ID. This column level statistic is not associated with any index, which is why this is null. I then have the columns in that statistic. Was it auto-created or not? Was it user-created? And th none of these are the user-created where I would have manually issued a create statistics command, so that's why they're all zero. None of them are filtered, and none of them are temporary or hypothetical. So I can see what stats exist pretty easily. And again, I like this query, even though it's a little bit big, um, way better than drilling through the UI. Now, while I'm here talking about stats, we end up kind of talking about indexes a little bit. And many of you probably use SD Help Index to see what indexes exist, right? So remember I said I have a, a statistic for each of my indexes. Well, these are the indexes that exist. And the thing that I really like to use is Kimberly's SD Help Index. So I mentioned this here just in case you've never seen it. You can pull it from her blog. You get the same information that you get from Help Index, but a ton more. So I get the index ID, whether or not it's disabled. I get the description and the index key, which I had before. But then if I'm interested in the internals, I get some great information about what columns are in the tree and what columns are in the leaf. And then what I really love, because I don't see this in the regular um, help index, is whether or not there's any included columns and whether there's any filter definition on that. So just a quick shout out here. Now, if I want to look at a particular statistic, meaning I don't want to just see what statistics exist for an object, right, using this query that I use up here, I want to actually dig in to see what does the statistic look like? What does that distribution of data look like? So this, for this we use DBCC show statistics. This is the, the option that's been around the longest. I'm going to show you a different one, but this is what you'll use probably a, a lot of the time. And you input the name of the object, so our table, and then the name of the statistic. And in this case, I'm going to look at the person table first, and I'm going to look at this last name, first name, middle name statistic, because the image that I showed you in the slide was on last name. So I want to show you that in terms of what it would look like within SQL Server. And it's right here. right? So on the left, we have all of the different values. These are called the steps in the histogram. And there's a maximum of 200 steps. And this tells me for each step that it has, how many values are equal to that, this EQ underscore rows. So for Anderson, I can see that there's 85 rows in the table that have a last name of Anderson. And for Black, I have 35. And if we look down and we look for Smith, right? Smith had 103. So this is that distribution of data. This is the histogram right here. Now, I'm going to flip back to our sales order detail table because this is where we're going to use for a lot of our demos today. And by default, when you run show statistics, you'll probably just run it in this way. Notice that in the first time that I ran it, I had this with histogram at the end because I just wanted to see the histogram. There's actually three parts to the show statistic. So when I execute this, in the top half, I get the header. In the middle, I get the density vector. And at the bottom, I get the histogram. And today, I just want to concentrate on the header and the histogram. The header is where I always tend to go first when I'm troubleshooting and I think that statistics might be an issue. Because what I want to see is I want to see when they were last updated, and then I want to see how many rows were in the table at the time they were updated. And I want to see how many rows were sampled when the update occurred. So this is at the time of the update, which means that these were updated earlier. It's Still this evening for me. I know it's the middle of the day for y'all. But this was just updated, and this is how many rows were in there now. It doesn't mean that's still what's in there, right? It's just at that point in time. And then the other thing I like to look at is this histogram. So in this case, right, we're not looking at last names. This one, which is on sales order detail, is on product ID. So these values here, 707, 708, these are different product IDs, and I can see how many product IDs exist in the table. All right. And if I just wanted to look at the header, I can do show statistics with that header and execute that. And it just gives me this information. Now, you can look at this and you can think, well, geez, if I wanted to look at something like the stat header for a lot of statistics, that becomes really painful because I have to issue that command for every single statistic, which is annoying. And that's where this new DMF comes in. Now, it's not new anymore, depending on what version you're running. It might be new to you. 
Uh, but I really like it because I query sys stats and objects and schemas like I did before, and then we cross apply over to DMDB stats properties, and we pass in the object ID and the stats ID. And what we get, and I'm only doing this for sales order detail, but what we get in our output is the same information we've seen before, but now I get to see when stats were last updated, and this is coming from that DMF, not from show statistics, but the DMF. And I see how many rows were in the table at the time, I see how many rows were sampled at the time, and I see how many steps were in the histogram, and this is really cool, I see how many rows have been modified since those were created. So this is, this is pretty good information here that I get from that DMF. So now I know what stats and what indexes exist. How is the optimizer going to use that information? So we're going to start with a very simple query. We're going to select against sales order detail for a particular product ID, 732. And we're going to include our actual plan. So let's go ahead and execute that. And we end up getting 130 rows in the output. And if we look at the plan, we can see that it did this index seek over here, and it did a key lookup because the columns that I asked for weren't all in the index. And we've got a nested loop in our output. But what I'm interested in here is this index seek because that's fun. Hang on. I like that. OK, so this is why you can't run Control-1 to zoom it if you haven't opened up zoom it. Here we go. Much better, right? So if we look at this, you can see down here that we have our seek predicate, which is what are we looking for, right? We were looking for product ID of 732. And in here, we can see how many rows it estimated, 130. And then we can see how many rows it actually returned, 130. Now we get our estimated on our actual because I asked for the actual plan. And so this is that this estimated number of rows, that's the cardinality estimate. So SQL Server, how did it know that it was going to get 130 rows? Well, if you look at the histogram, and we come down here, and we look for product ID of 732, here it is. So for 732, if you look at the EQ rows, the equal rows, you'll see right here it says 130. So when I said, give me everything for product ID 732, it came in here and it said, all right, the histogram says there's 130. That's my estimate, 130. And they happened to match, right? The estimate and the actual matched. It doesn't always happen. Let's see what happens if we try 840. I get no rows returned. If I look at my plan and I come back in here, right, we can see way at the bottom. My seek predicate is where product ID is 840. The estimated number of rows is 103. My actual is zero. So you, in, in, in this example, zero versus 103, it's not a huge difference in terms of the number, right? 100 rows off, not so bad. The, the order of magnitude is pretty big, though, right? It's way off. And so when you're looking at query plans and you're looking at these cardinality estimates and you're comparing them to the actuals, you want to, get an, you want to see how far off they are. Is this a big percentage off? Here it is, but it's 100 rows. If I estimate 100 rows and, I, and my actual number of rows is, let's say, 100,000, that's a problem. Okay? So when we talk about a cardinality estimate issue, that issue is when your estimate and your actual are way off. So now why is that the case? Now, they're not way off here, but for our example, right, they don't match. So let's see what happens when we look at our show stats. So I come down here to the histogram, and I look for a value of 840. I don't have it. I have 838, right, here, and I have 843, but I don't have 840. So the way that the histogram works is that it, it, nece it doesn't necessarily have a step or a bucket for every single value. If I have more than 200 product IDs, it can't have a step for every one of those. So it starts to do this compression, where as it's going through and it's looking at the different product IDs, when it gets to 200, then it starts to take that information and kind of compress it down, which is what it's done here. And, and this is where understanding the rest of the histogram, the range rows, 
the distinct range rows and the average comes into play. So between this, between 738, excuse me, between 838 and 843, we have 839, 840, 841, and 842, right? We have four additional values that can occur. And so this range rows means that between 838 and 843, there's 207 rows. And for those 207 rows, there's two distinct values. So then the average, 207 divided by 2, is 103.5. So when SQL Server when, when I say to SQL Server, I want to know, give me everything for product ID equals 840. It comes in here to the histogram, and it says, all right, I don't have an 840, but I can go right in here, right, right in between. And for 843, it tells me that on average is 103.5. So that's what my cardinality estimate is for 840. And that would be the value if I put in 841, 842, and also 839 because they fall into that range. So if I come back and look at it again, right, my estimate was 103.5. Let's go back to blue. Blue's my favorite. All right. So if I look in here, right, give me a count of the product IDs between 839 and 842. Sure enough, 207. That matched what was in the histogram. And if I want to look at that by product ID, ah, I do have two distinct values, 839 and 841. 839 has 47, 841 has 160. No matter what value I put in here, it's going to estimate, all right, let's put 841 in. It's going to estimate 103.5 every time, right, even though in this case my actual is 160 because it's using that in information from the histogram. Okay. Now, I do see, I do see I have some questions, so let me, oh, I don't. Am I good for questions so far? Okay, so we do have a couple of questions that came through, so, mm -hmm. okay, how, how do statistics help with inserts? Um, that's a great question. That's a really good question. Um, how do they help with inserts? So it can it can affect it affects updates way more than it affects inserts. So think about when you have to do a big modification. It's going to look at the statistics to figure out how many rows it needs to update and maybe how it's going to go access that data. In terms of and for, for the update, in terms of the insert. It's got to add that row, it's got to add that data to the table and to the indexes no matter what. So it's going to have to figure out where those pages are. So would it really use the statistics? How would it affect that? It's not going to use them for an insert as much as it would for something like a select and an update. Um, because no matter what, it has to, it has to figure out where in the object to put the rows, if that makes sense. Um, that's, a, that's a hard one to answer without drawing, and I don't think I have enough time to draw. Um, so if my answer doesn't make sense, send me a follow-up email and I'll see if I can do better. Okay, one, one more question before we uh, move sure. along. So why are the index statistics both zero in auto-created and user-created? Wouldn't one be equal to one? Mm. Mm. Um, that's a good question. So if we come back here and we look at this query, and the question is, I said that SQL Server creates these index statistics for you. So then why aren't they either automatically created or user created? That's just not how they're defined. Um, that's the short answer. It doesn't log an index statistic as either auto created or user created. They're both zero. The auto created shows up for these underscore WA underscore this ones, the ones that the optimizer generates automatically. If I generated a create statistic statement like this and called it, you know, test on my sales, sales order detail, 
I don't even remember the syntax. Let's see if I can do this off the top of my head. First name. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Oh, let's try it on something that actually exists in sales order detail. Let's change it to person. Mm, let's see what else is in here. Sales order. So what happens when you go off script. Um, so I just created a statistic manually, right, on sales order ID, because that's the column that I could remember. So that one shows up as being user created. So that's the difference between those two. And index statistic is always going to be zero for both. Excellent. Thanks, Erin. Yep. OK. So let's flip back to the slides. And I want to talk about now um, how we find that staff information in the plan. And we've already done that to some degree, but we're going to take it a step further. So when we looked at our plan, which we did, and it was a pretty simple plan, right? We figured out what table it accessed and what index. We didn't look at this in great detail, but, but I can get that. I can see whether it did a seek or a scan. And if you remember, it did do an index seek there, and then it did a lookup. Um, it tells me the operators that were used. We had a nested loop in there in addition to our seek and our uh, lookup. Uh, it tells me how much these cost. It tells me how many rows it expected. And, and there's a lot more. There's a lot of information I don't get in my plan, right? If I look at just the plan in isolation, I don't see how long it took the query to execute. I don't see anything about IOs or locks or weights. Um, I don't see anything about the actual cost. The cost in a plan is always estimated. And so I throw this in here just as a reminder that don't use your plans alone when you're looking at tuning queries or looking at statistics issues. There's other information that you want to capture. But when you're looking at the plan, one of the things that's important to pay attention to is those estimates and those actuals. So when I ran that query, right, I included the actual plan, which means when I run this query, go get the plan that it uses. That's different than the estimated plan. And when I pull a plan from cache, that's the plan that's being used over and over. But the actuals don't get stored in there. The very first time that query runs, it puts estimates in there. And those estimates stay in there and are basically used every single time. And so anytime I pull a plan from cache, it doesn't have actual values in there. Um, and so I mention this here because when you're troubleshooting, sometimes someone will come in and they'll be like, hey, I'm having a problem with this query. It's running slowly. And, you'll, you'll, and they're running it from an application. And so you take the query and you run it in Management Studio and you're like, well, it works fine for me. And the thing is, is that you could be, in some cases, getting a different plan than the other person. And so you need to pull the plan from cash for their query. And then you need to pull the plan that you generate, the actual plan, and see if they're the same or not. Okay? So don't always assume that the actual plan that you get when you run it for Management Studio is the same as the plan that's in cash. All right. So let me open up this one. Now, back to AdventureWorks. And back to our query, the standard query we're going to use over and over. We're going to expand it here. So if I run this query slightly different, didn't include the plan, right? Let's look at the include actual plan. But notice here, if I say display estimated plan, it doesn't give me anything in the output. It doesn't actually run the query. It, it generates a plan for it, and it shows it to me, but it doesn't return any result. So here I get the same shape that I had before. I have an index seek, and then I have a key lookup. But if we look at this information, I only have estimates. I have no actuals. Now when I actually say include the plan and I run it, I end up getting the same plan as the estimate. Doesn't always happen, but I do in this case. So here I can see, okay, my estimates here were 58, and that's what actually returned. Brilliant. Okay. But I don't have any information about IO here, right? When I look at this plan, I can see something about the cost. I can get cost for the individual operators. I know how long it took because it, I can look in the window here. But if I save this plan out and share it with someone else, they're not going to have any idea. So I don't have anything about IO. But I can get that if I use set statistics IO. So if we turn this on, 
right? I had the same plan. But now when I look in my messages tab, I understand what object it access. I understand how much I.O. it required, right? So don't tune in isolation. You're going to need other information as well. Now, if I get this one, let's run this query again. I get the same plan. And by the way, I'm just going to give a little quick shout out here. I tend to look at plans in my demos just in Management Studio because it's what most people have. It's what they're familiar with. But if you've ever heard of SQL Century and you've heard of their plan explorer tool, it's a free tool. My build is way out of date, um, but it's completely free. And it, the newest release just does a ton of things. And this makes it way easier to look at query plans, particularly complex ones. This one's kind of cool because notice that in order for me to see estimates and actuals when I'm in Management Studio, I have to hover over the operator and look at it. Whereas here, all of that information is contained right up in the top part of this results window. And I can also still get it when I come down here, um, but I like that I don't have to hover over every operator to see the estimates and the actuals. All right. So, this looks pretty consistent, right? Every time I'm running this query, I'm getting a similar plan. But what happens if I run the query this way, right? If I run where product ID equals 871. Now I get a different plan. I get a clustered index scan. And I know there's a missing index warning here, but I'm not going to worry about that. But in, in the other scenario, right, if I run both of these together, Right? I get same query, different different product IDs, but I get two different plans. One has a seek and a lookup, and one has the scan of a clustered index. So this is an interesting thing that sometimes I might want to investigate further. And I would wonder in this case, like, did it even think about using that non-clustered index? Like, why would it scan the whole clustered index? Why wouldn't it use that non-clustered? So you might go and you might verify your indexes, right, and look to see what exists. Oh, and by the way, if you run that help index with the show plan on it, sometimes it takes a little bit longer. But the index that we've been using on product ID has an index ID of three. And then I've got my primary key, which is also my clustering key. And then I have another non-clustered index. So I want to note that this is an index ID of three. This is a cool um, option that I sometimes use when troubleshooting. I want to know. For this particular query, did it think about using that non-clustered index? And I can use these trace flags. Now, these are, are not fully documented, um, so use at your own risk. This is a blog post from Paul White that talks about them. And we're going to use trace flag 2363, which shows us the stats that it loads in 2014 and higher with compat mode 120 and higher. So, if we verify this, right, we see that we're in compat mode 120. And I've, I've got the code here, by the way, to run it in a lower compat mode, but we're just going to work with this here. So I'm going to run this with 3604, which outputs the information to my screen, and then 2363 for this value of 871. So let's see here. And I'm going to free procedure cache first, which is not for production use, as I have noted here. Let's go ahead and do that. So you can see again, I get my cluster to next scan. That's the plan that we expected. But now when I look at this messages, this is a lot of cool stuff. Now some of this stuff is way beyond what I want to talk about today. But what I'm looking for is this loaded histogram, right? And it tells me from stats with ID of three. Remember that was my index ID? So it did load this histogram. It looked at this to see, gee, do I want to use this index? And then I can see that it also loaded other ones as I come down here. And in the end, it didn't end up using um, this. It ended up doing a full scan because it decided it was less expensive to do that. So we're going to free this again. And then I'm going to run my um, query one more time. And then we're going to come down here. And if I want to understand what stats it used, because it doesn't tell me that anywhere in the plan either, I can use this EDCC trace on 8666. So again, this is not a supported trace flag, right? Use with caution. 
Um, this is a query from Fabiano's blog. I did not write this. I have given him full credit here. This is another option when you're troubleshooting. If you want to look to see what statistics it used, it will tell you that as well. So I can look to see which ones it considered. I can look to, to get information about what it used as well. But let's come back to our example. If I want to see what plan exists in cash for a particular query, remember I said that if someone comes to you and they're troubleshooting an issue or they're talking about a, a query that's not performing well, as part of your troubleshooting, you probably want to go and pull that plan from the cache to see what it looks like. This is a query that allows you to do that. Um, definitely run this, by the way, with isolation level of read uncommitted. I'll drop that down here just as a reminder. So this is because in some cases you may have a really large plan cache. So I've run this one time, right? And if we look, this is where 871, and I've executed the query one time. And if I scroll over, sorry for all the clicking, I also have the plan here, right? So I had it show me the plan um, because I had include actual plan, but this is the plan that's in cache right here. And if I, by the way, if I look at this, you'll see that because I've pulled this one from cache, right, it only has the estimate. All right, now what happens if I rerun all of the queries that I ran before, which had different product IDs. So let's run all of those, right? And they all run, and they all have the same plan. And I look in cache again, right? I see that for every variation that I ran, I have a different plan in cache. And that's because of the way, because it does textual matching. And even though all these queries look the same in the sense that it's just where product ID and it's a different product ID, um, it's not the exact same text. So each query gets put into the plan cache one time. Um, they all have the same query hash, and two, three of them have the same plan hash. One of them has a different plan hash. Right? But each of them exists separately. And this is a challenge because if I have a lot of ad hoc queries where users can input different values, and let's say that they only run those queries one time, this ends up bloating my cache, where I have a lot of queries a lot of plans for queries that only execute one time, and that takes up a lot of space. So this is where maybe I could do something like a stored procedure. So I'm going to create a stored procedure that has the exact same query in it, and we just pass in that product ID. So let's go ahead and create that. And then we're going to set statistics IO on, and then we're going to execute this query a whole bunch of times with different input values. So let's run that. And if we look at the plans, by the way, they're all going to have the exact same plan at this point. And let me grab the statistics I.O. So it's interesting here, because if you look at the statistics I.O., right, it's 500, 500, 188, 6200, 300, 14,000. Hmm. And if I look at the plans, Right, and I scroll down, I see this one down here. The lines are a little bit thicker, right? Where my estimate and my actual, right, my estimated number of rows, 167, the actual, right, these are very, very different. So I've got a lot more I.O. as a result. But if I look in cache now to see what exists, right, here's that store procedure that I just created. I've executed it six times. So I only have one entry in the plan cache for that as opposed to one entry for each distinct product ID that I entered. Okay, so there's a lot of information I can get from the plan about stats. I still need to use other things like statistics IO, and I still want to look at the plan cache as a whole to get additional information. Questions before I hop back to the slides? We've got one question, Baron. Um, do we need all columns to have statistics? Ah, do you need all columns to have statistics? No. Um, there's a way to create those. I'll talk about that in a minute, which I don't recommend. I typically recommend letting the optimizer create them where it needs them, where it gives additional information. Statistics aren't huge. The stats blob it not a huge entity. Um, 
but I don't think that it's necessary to go and create statistics on every single column just because the column exists. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So last section here is what happens to our query plan when we update statistics? So far we've been talking about how stats get, get created, how we, we find them, how the optimizer uses them. Well, they're not static entities, right? Our data isn't static. So stats can get updated automatically. And this happens when a, enough data has changed that SQL Server says, hey, I need to change. I need to update stats. I need better information. So the default is a minimum of 500 plus 20 percent of the rows in the table. Oh my goodness, this is what happens when you roll the thing on your mouth. The exception is trace flag 2371, which was introduced in 2008, our 2SP1. And actually, uh, in 2016, that's default behavior. So what that trace flag does is it reduces the number of rows that have to change in order for an automatic update to occur. So consider a table that has 100,000 rows. 20% of that is going to be, what, 20,000 rows, right? So if I have 100,000 rows in the table and 20,000 of them change, then stats are going to be automatically updated when they're used again, which means SQL Server is going to come in and say, oh, these are out of date. I'm going to go ahead and update them. Now, this sounds like a good thing. And, and there are cases where it really is. But it's usually not a full scan of the data. Um, which for really large tables like a million rows or 100 million rows is okay. Um, and you can control whether it happens immediately or whether it's asynchronous. And this happens for index stats, for column stats, and for filtered stats. And most of the time this is good, but imagine I have a table that has um, 100 million rows, right? 20% of that is a really high number. And how frequently does 20% of a 100 million row table change? It's probably not that often, which is one reason for this trace flag of 2371. It makes that the, the amount of data that has to change lower. But I'll tell you, I'd really rather you manage statistics. And there's a couple of ways that this can happen. One is it can happen as a part of rebuilding your indexes. So if you've got a job in place that rebuilds indexes on a regular basis, then every time you rebuild an index, its statistic gets updated. But it only updates the index stats. So in the case of sales order detail, let's say that I rebuilt all the indexes on sales order detail, that column statistic doesn't get updated. Okay? Um, but the great thing about the index rebuild is it's a full scan. It's a 100% sample of the data. Now, I can also do this manually. And Manually means I issue an update statistics command, whether I type it in Management Studio, which I hope I'm only doing on a case-by-case -case basis, or I have it in job, right? If you use something like Ola Hallengren's maintenance, he's got a step in there that's going to update statistics for you. My other option is I can do something called SP update stats. I have a whole blog post about why I don't love SP stats, and the short of it is that when you issue that command, it's for the entire database, and it's looking to see if one row in a table has changed, just one. So if I have a table that has 100 million rows and one row has changed, it's going to go ahead and update stats, which isn't a decision that I really want the I really want SQL Server to make. There's a combination of things that happens here, I think, in the ideal world, which is that you manage statistics through your index rebuilds and through another job that looks to see if stats are out of date and need to be updated. We could have a whole 15 minute to 15 to 20 minute conversation just on that alone. But I want you to understand that there's different options for how stats get updated. Now, how does this affect your queries? Well, those plans that sit there in the plan cache are going to continue to be reused until that query is no longer issued or so many other queries are, are being issued that they get um, aged out. Or the plan could be invalidated. So the age out, kind of how that happens, is, is listed here on the screen, where it depends upon how often that query is used. So if that stored procedure that I just created is something that's executed every minute by the system, then that plan is going to stay in there all the time, 
probably. I've seen plans persist in cash for months because the query ran on such a regular basis. Now, invalidated is something different, right? The data in your database changes, not in every single table, but in certain core tables, right? That data changes significantly, and it can change faster in some tables than in others. And because of that, because that data changes, the distribution of data in the table can change as well. And as such, the query plan that you had when the data looked one way may no longer be appropriate when the query looks, when the data looks a different, different way. So when I've changed enough data in a table and I need to update stats, SQL Server invalidates that stats, which invalidates any plans that use those statistics. So the next time I go and I run the query that has that plan, that query says, oh, these stats need to be updated. And when we update stats, I get a new plan that gets used. And this is a good thing because it's trying to make sure that it has the best plan based upon the distribution of data that you have. So this occurs when I've changed um, data, but it also occurs for these reasons that I have here. If I do an alter table, if I do an alter procedure, if I change or drop an index that's in the plan, if I update the stats that's in the plan, um, if I've got lots of rows in the insert or deleted tables and I'm doing triggers, um, or if I call a recompile or use with recompile, right? Then the plan's invalidated. So I really want to focus on the statistic part of this. Now, why do we invalidate? I mentioned this already, right? It's because we're thinking that it's going to be faster if I have statistics that are more up to date because a certain amount of data has changed. I'm going to update stats. I'm going to get a potentially better plan. Um, but it doesn't guarantee that it's going to be faster or better. And you can you can track your recompilations. Uh, you can do it in Perfmon just to see how often recompiles are occurring. If you want more detailed information about why they're occurring, you can use extended events. Or if you're on 2008 R2 and earlier, you can use trace. So let's see what this looks like in action. So this is our last demo here. Back to AdventureWorks. We're going to go back and look at statistics for sales order detail for this product ID, right? So 121,000 rows in the table, and, and it was a full sample, a full scan, or 100% sample with the same number of rows. Now, what happens as I change some data? So we're going to add, this is about 24,000 rows, I think, get added, yep, into the table. So I had 121,000. I'm going to have like 140-some thousand at this point. So let me rerun my stored procedure here. And now let me see what I have in the cache. Remember before I had six execution counts, and now I only have one because my plan recompiled. When I added those rows, it invalidated statistics because 20% or more of the data in the table had changed, right? 121,000, 121,000, 20% is about 24. I just tipped it. And if we look at the plan, right, we see that it is a clustered index scan, right? Before I had that nice little lookup, um, the index scoop with the lookup, now I've got a clustered index scan. So my plan was invalidated, and this time when I executed it, after it updated stats, it generated this plan. So I'm going to verify here, right? Auto create, auto update stats is enabled, right? So this is why those stats automatically updated. This is a database setting. It's on by default if you're not aware of it. I'll pop into the UI for once, actually. But if I come in here to options, Right? Both of these settings, auto-create statistics and auto-update statistics, they are enabled by default when you create a database. I recommend leaving them enabled. And because that's on, that's why those stats automatically updated. So how does this affect my query performance? Let's turn on Statistics I.O. again and rerun those same six queries that I ran before. Let's include the execution plan this time, because I think I wanted to do that. Ah, one thing I want to do here, this is the I.O. Remember when I looked at this before, right? When I looked at the I.O. before, I had logical reads that were all over the place. And now when I look at the I.O., it's the same every time, right? Now, 
how this can manifest in your environment, your your users don't see all this, right? How it in, how it manifests to them is that all of a sudden there's a performance issue with the store procedure, right? They will come to you and they'll be like, you know, this thing was running fine, and now all of a sudden when I run this, it's not running well. Like, what's going on? So what you might do is you might come in and you might say, well, okay, well, let me see what it looks like for me. And so you run this store procedure, and you see, sure enough, it's doing a clustered index scan. And you know that most of the time it does this index seek and this lookup. And so you're like, well, why is it doing clustered index scan? That's not what I want. So you go and you maybe take a look at your indexes. Right, because you're thinking, well, maybe it's scanning because somebody dropped the index. Well, no, that index that it's always been using is still there. So then you think, well, let me go look at stats. Let me see when stats were last updated. Well, here's my index. Well, stats were just updated, but, hmm, this is interesting. I've got 146,000 rows in the table, but you know what? It only sampled 70,000. It didn't read through every single row to come up with a histogram. It only sampled 70,000 of them. So maybe the statistics that it has aren't very good. So this is a common knee-jerk approach that we see, right, where someone, where, where clear performance isn't going well and someone looks at stats and because stats are maybe a little bit out of date or maybe they're not a full scan, they think, well, I'm going to go ahead and update stats. So let's do that. Okay, updated them with a full scan. So now let me rerun my procedure. Let me see if I fixed my issue. Well, it's still doing my index scan. So then I might come in here and do this sledgehammer approach, right, which is let me free procedure cache. Let me get rid of every single plan that's in cache. And this could potentially solve your problem, but it might not. And in our case, it's not going to. And this happens in the real world. Right now we see that we still have this clustered index scan going on. And, we, and by the way, we probably just spiked CPU on the server because we had to recompile every single query that's running. And this is where you need to stop. Right, you've got to think, what are we doing here to troubleshoot? Right, we looked at freeing the procedure cache, which didn't work. We could have just removed that one plan for the cache. I've seen people restart the instance. Right, they've been like, well, let me just restart the instance. And, and sometimes that seems to work, but that's really not troubleshooting. Right, what I really want to do is look a little bit closer at my plan. So let me go see what is in cache right now. Right, here's our procedure. Right, so. In cache, I have this clustered index scan that's going on. And if I look at this in detail, right, I can see that it's thinking that it's going to return 4,800 rows. So what do I see for compilation? This is a, this is a really cool thing to do. So if you don't know um, about the properties, it's F4. So when I click, on F4, I get additional information as I click on each of the operators. And when I click on the select, notice that over here I have the parameter list. And it tells me the value that the query was compiled with. It was 870. And I know that I'm hitting my hour mark. And if you can bear with me, that would be awesome because I'm almost done. So it compiled this query with a value of 870. So it would have looked at the histogram to say, all right, how many rows am I going to get for 870? Well, it's over 4,000. And it would have decided what to do based on that. 4,000 rows, it decided, is more efficient to get those by scanning the clustered index than by doing that seek. And if you think back to the number of IOs that we had, you'll start to understand why. So if I look at my show statistics, right, and I look at 870, Right, it's going to tell me 4,885 rows. Okay. Um, and if I look here at everything in the table and I order by the product ID and the count, right, I see that value has the most number of rows in the table. And that's kind of an anomaly, right? A lot of a lot of these are a lot smaller counts. So if I run this with literal values, right, this is how I would troubleshoot this. Let's see what I get if I just throw the different literal values in. And this is what we were seeing before, right? I get different, two different plans depending on what literal value I use. 
In the case of something like 732, where I get 166 rows returned, right? It knows that doing the index seek in the lookup is less I.O. than doing the scan, right? 520. Because doing the scan is 2,379. But for these other values, it's better to do the seek. And so this is, if you haven't seen it before, right, this is the parameter sensitivity issue, where depending upon the value that I put in, it can generate a plan that's pretty stable and pretty good for most of my values, but there's exceptions. And so which plan do I want to have in cash? Right? This is the one that works for most of the values, and as long as this plan's in cash, things perform well. But when this plan, with my clustered index scan, gets into cash, then it kind of goes all crazy because it's scanning that clustered index. And this is a small example, but this definitely happens in production environments. So now that I understand that, why doesn't updating statistics address it? So this is a really important piece right here. So what do I have right now in cache? Let's revisit that, right? Here's my create procedure. This is all the literal stuff that I ran, but this is the create procedure, right? And this one is that index scan. Let me close some of these windows so there's not so much going on. So that's what I have in cache right now. So if I come in here and I update stats, right? This should invalidate our plan, correct? If I remember what I told you in the slide. So I'm going to update stats, and if I look here at show statistics, right, 1132 for me, 132 I think for you, right, absolutely they've been updated right now. Now if I rerun the store procedure, and I'm going to rerun the store procedure with a 739, which is a smaller value, which should give me that seek, and I look at the plan, I still get the clustered index scan. Still, for all of these I'm going to get that. Right? Every single time. It's, it's using that same plan. And if I look at the execution count, I would have thought that back here when I updated stats, my plan was invalidated. So I've run this six times. So this should be at six, right? It's not 12. Why is it 12? Right? This is because of a change in SQL Server 2012. And I'm going to say it and then I'm going to walk through it. In 2012 and higher, Right, and I'm on 2014, and this is true in 2016. In 2012, if you went and you issued an update statistics command, the update statistics would run. We saw that, right? We saw it in show statistics. But SQL Server knew that no data had changed. So even though I updated statistics, because the number of rows modified was zero, it didn't invalidate the plan. So to prove this to you, if I come in here and I update one row of data, right, one row. Now I'm going to update my statistics again. And if we look at our show statistics, we should see that it now says 1133, not 1132. Now I'm going to rerun the store procedure. And in fact, let me be consistent. Right, 739, 739. Now I get my index peak, right? That invalidated the plan. And when I look here, right, here's my create procedure, execution count of one. So let me go back to the slide because I have this here. So in 2012 and higher, when stats are updated, if no data has changed, plans won't invalidate. And auto-update stats has no longer any effect on this. If you're running 2008R2 and below, if you updated stats and you had the auto-update stats option enabled, it would invalidate plans, paying no attention to how much data has changed. If you updated stats and you happen to have auto-update stats disabled, it would not invalidate plans. So this is a big thing to understand depending on what version you're running. And by the way, if you're on 2000, if you're on a version before 2012 and you have auto update stats off and you're updating your stats manually, then to get around this and to, to get your plans invalidated, you can do an SP recompile for every object that updates your stats. But my point 
is that you really need to be careful when you're troubleshooting because I don't want you to inadvertently spend time updating statistics when you don't need to, right? Because it takes time to do that and it takes resources. So when you're back, right? When you head back to the office, when you finish this webinar, right? Understand that stats are invaluable, right? And that plans are going to be reused until they get invalidated or aged out. And updating stats will invalidate the plan unless no data has changed in 2012 and higher, or you've got auto update stats disabled in 2008 R2 and below. So my takeaway here is don't blindly update stats as a first step in troubleshooting, right? Dig into the plan like we did to try to understand what's going on. So I've got some references slides, but any questions? And I apologize I went over. That's okay, Erin. So we, we've got one question for you. So how often do you monitor the plan cache in order to identify duplicate plans that are bloating the cache? Ah, that's a great question. Kimberly has a post on that. I think that I have this listed in here. Um, I don't, but I will add it. Um, Kimberly has a, has a blog post that that I'll, that gives you the query that you can query the plan cache, and it will show you how many plans exist, and it will tell you how many of those plans are single use plans and how much space it consumes. And so her blog post talks about how to monitor that, um, what's kind of a, a threshold that you can use, and how to remove those plans on a regular basis if you need to. All right, thank you. Okay, we just mm -hmm. have one come through. So if some of the query has with recompile option, how do we remove it? Mm -hmm. How do you, it, well, it's not going to, it's going to recompile every single time. So if you have that option on a query, then whenever that query executes, it's compiling the plan at that point. All right. Well, thank you, Erin. Thank you, everybody, for coming along to this month's session. As Erin uh, mentioned, these uh, uh, scripts and the slide deck will be made available, and the recording of this session will be up on the uh, DBA Fundamentals archive page so that you can come back and review and uh, work through the, the scripts that um, Aaron will provide. Now, we're on again. We possibly might be on at a different time next month. At this stage, we are scheduled for the second Tuesday of the month, but I may have to move it to the first Monday or the third Monday. That will hopefully be... Uh, sorted out in the next day or two and uh, you will get an update. So until then, thank you all. Have a good week, have a good month and we'll talk to you all again next month.